Uh, if we could remind everyone uh, while you're not presenting to please mute your microphones. And it looks like we have most of our panelists here uh, and ready and a number of our participants have joined. So let's go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, our AB Nexus Research Blitz, the first of hopefully many activities that will help with connectivity across our campuses. Uh, just to introduce myself, um, if we haven't met before, I'm Kristen Krzyzewski. I'm a research partnership specialist working on the Boulder campus um, as part of the AB Nexus initiative. And also wanted to introduce my colleague uh, and counterpart, Diane. Hi all, thank you for being here. It's exciting to uh, launch this grant program with this Research Blitz activity. Very excited to hear about all of your research. Um, as Kristen said, I'm Diane Liddell over at the Anschutz campus. So just a few housekeeping things. Again, if you're not presenting, uh, please mute your microphones and we'll get started here. Um, Presenters, you'll notice in the bottom right hand corner, uh, we'll give you visual cues at the two minute, one minute and four minute mark uh, to let you know where your timing is. If anyone has any trouble joining, hearing, seeing slides, uh, please send a chat message to Diane um, and she can help navigate uh, through any challenges. So without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Juan Park. Juan. Uh, take it away. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Juan Park with the Electrical Engineering Department in Boulder Campus. I want to present our project uh, targeted on developing nanomaterials for bladder cancer therapy. Bladder cancer is the sixth most common cancer, and the current therapy was originally developed 40 years ago, and it remains rather ineffective with a recurrence rate uh, over 40% and is also expensive. So our research goal is to develop a nanoparticle cluster that can sim simultaneously detect subclinical cancer and upon detection, kill cancer cells selectively. We believe bladder cancer is, an ideally, uh, is ideally suited for this nano uh, technology based approach because bladder is accessible we can administer the drug directly into the bladder without systemic exposure. Bladder cancer cells also overexpress epidermal growth factor receptor or EGFR, EGFR offering a nice target with which we can target cancer cells specifically. So for the technical approach, we develop uh, multifunctional nanoclusters composed of gold nanorod for cell killing and upconvergent fluorescence nanoparticles for fluorescence detection and antibody to EGFR for cancer cell targeting. We have conducted a series of in vitro experiments with which we demonstrated selective binding with EGFR positive cancer cells and selective killing of cancer cells by uh, thermal ablation or optoporation. We have also demonstrated efficacy in mouse models. Uh, we are continuing the mouse studies now, and we are also planning to expand the animal studies to canine models in collaboration with a team at Colorado State University. We are also conducting a series of experiments to evaluate the safety of our materials. The, the team consists of uh, Professor Thomas Flake as School of Medicine at Anschutz campus. He is an oncologist and he is the leading investigator for in the animal study. And also Professor Jared Brown, School of Pharmacy at Anschutz campus. He is a toxicologist and he is leading the safety study. We are looking for potential collaborators with expertise in immunology, pathology, and surgery, among other things. The current, the, currently, the project is funded through the Spark Reach program, and we will be seeking further funding from NCI and also uh, some venture capitals. The outcome, expected outcome, will be a novel therapy for bladder cancer, and the, the, uh, we believe this approach will be readily applicable to other cavitary cancers 
with a uh, presenting a similar anatomy as, as bladder. As I said, bladder cancer is the sixth most common cancer, so the potential impact on health um, will be pretty high, and the potential, potential market worldwide is expected to be over $2 billion per year in the next few years. Thank you. Thanks, Juan. Next up, we have Nivedita Naresh. Nivedita, are you joined? Let's see if we can uh, follow up with her, Diane, and move on. Sanya? I believe you're still muted, Sanya. Sorry, I had trouble with my unmuting. Here I am. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, my name is Svenja Knappe, and I'm an associate research professor in the mechanical engineering department um, in Boulder. And my research centers around um, small quantum sensors. And, and for the past many years, we've developed um, miniature magnetic field sensors. And they, by now, rival the performance of cryogenic sensors. So um, squid magnetometers are really the best mag magnetic sensors that are out there. And um, we're developing a, a technology that does not need cryogenic cooling. Um, and instead they're based of the use of light and the vapor of atoms. And they're called optically pumped magnetometers. And the technology itself is not new, but we're trying to miniaturize them with um, microfabrication technologies. And so we have used these sensors. So we've developed sensors and sensor systems, and we've used them successfully for measurement of, um, of non-invasive brain imaging and also heart imaging. So magnetoencephalography, MEG, or magnetocardiography. Um, and um, we have a, a current R01 NIH research grant that is a collaboration between our group in Boulder, um, the group of Isabel Ward, who's at the MEG Center at Anschutz, um, and also Mark Spitz, who's a neurologist at Anschutz. Um, and then we have an external collaborator, Laurie, Laurie Parkin, and all. And, and the goal of this grant is um, to specifically develop a brain imaging system based on these novel LPM sensors um, that can be brought closer to telemetry. So right now they're big stationary equipment um, and what we're trying to do is to move them into environments where the patient can actually move with these sensors. Right now this is all still in a shielded environment, um, but the long-term goal is to take it out of the shielding and, and develop a method where um, you can do brain imaging um, in, in much more um, realistic paradigms. Um, and, and so what we're interested in is to take this into other applications as well, other either brain imaging applications or other biomedical imaging applications. Um, right now it is, it is mostly focused on epilepsy, but, but um, MEG is used for a variety of um, diagnostic methods and in, apart from epilepsy, such as non-degenerative diseases, um, like mild traumatic brain injuries, but, but also for, let's say, fetal cardiography. And so what we're interested in is to see, um, are there any other potential co collaborations or advantages for, for other applications um, that could benefit from having um, a magnetic imaging system that 
can be either more mobile or can allow new paradigms um, or um, something that we haven't even thought about yet. One advantage of these sensors is that you can, that they're not in a stationary doer, so you can get closer to the source. You get usually bigger signals than you can with the current MEG technology um, and potentially better images with that. And so um, we, we are very excited about the, co the current collaboration we have. Um, and we're really hoping that we can push this, this forward um, to, um, to really go into this unshielded environment where at some point we're not constrained by the shielded room anymore, but also into this, this environment where the, the patients can move. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think I saw Nivedita join, so you can pop back. Hi, uh, hi, so I'm from Children's Hospital, Colorado. Um, my expertise is in cardiac MRI methods, um, accelerated cardiac MRI imaging. Uh, so uh, my project was to be able to use deep learning methods to accelerate pediatric and fetal MRI. Uh, so traditionally, there have been uh, several compressed sensing algorithms that have been uh, used to accelerate imaging methods. And uh, it has been, but most of these compressed sensing algorithms have mostly been applied offline. And so the image, rec image reconstruction times can be between anything between like one to four hours. Sometimes it can be a few minutes too, but it can be up to four hours as well, especially for 3D reconstructions. So recently there has been uh, the uh, emergence of deep learning methods where they, they use the uh, databases of the images that have already been collected over several years to train these convolutional neural network models or CNN models. And uh, the image reconstruction times are accelerated uh, up to where the image reconstruction can be done within just a few minutes. Uh, so, but um, until now, uh, the deep learning methods have mostly been applied for other purposes such as image classification, image segmentation. There have been very few groups who have been looking at image, uh, the applying deep learning methods to image reconstruction. Uh, it, there have been a few, uh, most of them, but there are only a few groups that have been looking at these uh, techniques for image reconstruction methods. So my, um, my project was to be able to use the applied these algorithms to accelerate pediatric and fetal MRI methods. For both these uh, imaging techniques, uh, anesthesia is, is, is a problem. Um, and the goal is always to sort of reduce anesthesia times and to be able to sort of achieve consistent MRI where you can sort of have like a free running framework and acquire all the images without the need for anesthesia. Essentially, that is the eventual goal. Uh, but until now, that's obviously it's not clinically possible. We still do need anesthesia um, as it's, it's difficult for kids to hold still. Uh, so for, for so, but with the application of deep learning techniques where we can use the databases of the images that have already been collected over the several years to accelerate these uh, imaging times, it is, it's, it's, I think it's a possible, it's a possible eventual goal. So the, um, my, I'm, I'm looking through this research blitz. I was hoping to find uh, people with deep learning expertise um, who would be able to apply these techniques to pediatric and fetal MRI methods. Uh, so this would be essentially be performed in like two main steps. Uh, well, one would be we already have some some compressed sensing techniques which we have been applying offline. There have been uh, recently there have been some vendor optimized techniques as well, and uh, but uh, but these are mostly applicable to like very specific methods such as Cartesian methods. So uh, so the, my goal was to be able to compare the compressed sensing, traditional compressed sensing techniques to, uh, to deep learning techniques and see how much we can push the image uh, reconstruction times. So that this would be achieved in two main steps. One would be to develop, first would be to uh, see which deep learning algorithms apply, uh, apply the best for pediatric and fetal MRI methods, and then to be able to use that for multiple imaging techniques, such as the, for the first application is generally cardiac function, because that is that is sort of the most broadly used uh, method for uh, pediatric and fetal MRI to diagnose congenital heart diseases. 
so that would be the first application to see uh, what deep learning methods would be able to be applicable for these. And then we, and once we have sort of a pipeline established uh, where we can use these deep learning algorithms, these the same algorithms can be applied to uh, all the other um, spectrum of cardiac imaging or even like the entire body imaging, neuro imaging techniques. Uh, so that's that's the um, the attractive part of deep learning, where it is very broadly applicable to multiple uh, imaging techniques. Thank you. Next up, we have Andrew Goodwin. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for for joining this uh, this session. Um, my lab is in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering at CU Boulder. Um, and it started, uh, we, we make a lot of materials and we specifically focus on the interface of those materials. Um, one thing, one question we got interested in is that if you build a contrast agent, something that can absorb external energy like ultrasound or light, can we do anything with the energy that was absorbed? Um, and so what we've done in my lab is design these interfacial structures that promote cavitation, which is the formation of a gas bubble. And when you do this uh, at physiological conditions, the bubble collapses, and if it's on a particle, then the particle will move at a very high velocity, like meters per second. Um, and so this has two, uh, or, or this has um, an important uh, result. First of all, it can enhance things like photoacoustic imaging, but then it also can uh, result in the formation of channels into tissue. And so we're looking at this as a potential way to enhance uh, delivery of drugs and other therapeutics into areas that are traditionally very hard to access. So solid tumors are, of course, a classic example. We also want to look at musculoskeletal tissues. Um, so right now, the collaboration team um, is myself uh, for doing the light conversion to cavitation. We're working with Jen Cha in the department to try to synthesize gold nanorods with these structures. Um, and really the expertise that I would hope to look for is, is definitely someone on, on the pharmacy side who can uh, understand the challenges of getting molecules, particles, antibodies, etc. into these tissues um, and um, what kind of what we need to do to tune our, um, our structures. Uh, currently, uh, we have funding from NSF to uh, look at the basic science side of turning light into propulsion and what kind of tissues we can move through. Um, and then we would like to pursue some kind of higher dollar uh, funding. Do you mind pushing it back? Putting some high, some high dollar, higher dollar funding uh, through NIH. Um, and that, of course, would depend a little bit on the, on the collaborator. So uh, on the technical approach side, we've shown that we can get particles with specific surface structures. We can convert ultrasound energy, specifically high intensity focused ultrasound. We can convert light energy. I would imagine if we tried a little harder um, and, and made the right particles, we could use magnetic energy with, with uh, alternating magnetic fields into these unstable bubbles. We need to evaluate the efficacy in animal models, of course. Um, and I should put them in the team. We, we are, have proposed um, working with Todd Pitts in um, uh, GI oncology with PDX models. Uh, we'd also like to expand to all-in-one delivery agents. So one thing we were uh, anticipating was that these nanobullets, if you want to call them that, would create uh, transport channels, but then they could also be used as delivery agents in, in and of themselves. Okay, so the outcomes, uh, as I've already talked about, uh, we want to deliver therapeutics and, and potentially immunostimulatory agents into hard to treat areas, and the impact would probably be in chemotherapy of unresectable cancers, so pancreatic and brain definitely come to mind, um, and then potentially uh, improving post surgical outcomes of musculoskeletal repair. So, in areas where we can't get good blood flow, can we increase the amount of, of transport? Um, and potentially deliver to these hard to treat areas. And uh, that concludes my slide. Thank you. Next up, we have Antonio Porras. Yeah, I'm here. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Antonio Porras, and I am uh, an assistant professor at the Department of Biostatistics and Informatics in the School of Public Health uh, here at the Anschutz campus. Uh, my background is in computer and biomedical engineering and machine learning, and I also have a PhD in clinical image computing. 
So today I'm here looking for a collaborator in the Boulder campus to work on one of the projects uh, that I'm doing right now. So currently most head malformation children, uh, syndromes in children are identified after the uh, visual evaluation of abnormalities. Usually when they become obvious or when uh, children develop severe symptoms related to uh, brain growth constraints. When it comes to their surgical treatment, the approach is also subjective and almost a surgical art. So the outcomes are very depending on the expertise of the surgical team because there are no objective and personalized uh, metrics or references to target during surgery. During the last few years, I have been working on the creation of automatic methods to analyze and characterize the head in children, both normal and pathologic. Uh, these methods can now identify and quantify local head abnormalities with very high accuracy, either from CT images or from 3D photographs. As a result, they can bring objectivity into a currently subjective uh, patient evaluation and treatment. What the project is missing is a graphic interface that can make possible the translation of all these technologies for clinical use and for clinical research purposes. My goal here is to identify collaborators who could help us creating the user-friendly interface to this end. On the developing side, current methods have been designed using state-of-the-art lab libraries for uh, medical image computing and computer vision, such as ITK or BTK. And most of the code has been written in Python 3. So starting from these developments, we would like to create a modular graphic interface using WX and OpenGL for user interaction and, and visualization. The current team is formed by two other members in my lab and a list of surgeons from the departments of plastic surgery and neurosurgery at the Children's Hospital, uh, where I also have an appointment. My lab works very closely with the surgeons and they are very supportive of this project as they know the potential to improve the clinical practice. Uh, the collaborator that we want to find here would bring into the team the expertise that we don't have on software and graphic user interface development. So the project is currently funded by uh, the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research through an R00 award. Uh, this covers the development of the methods which are ongoing but not the clinical translation. As the project keeps growing, there is also a lot of potential to receive additional funding from federal agencies. So in addition to NADCR, there is NICHT and NIB, NIBIB at NIH, or also the NSF, uh, are institutions for which uh, we could explore future funding. As these methods uh, will enable analyzing pediatric cranial development and how it, is, how it is affected by the presence of different pathologies, genetic factors, or even ancestors. In terms of outcomes, the software is gonna improve significantly the clinical management of patients with cranial pathology and will provide clinicians and scientists with a quantitative framework to advance research in the field as well. More specifically, it's gonna enable low-cost, uh, non-invasive, radiation-free, automatic screening of cranial pathologies through the use of 3D photography. It will also provide a quantitative evaluation, diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up of patients whose current assessment is subjective and often differs among institutions and surgeons. Now, ultimately, this quantitative approach will help identify pathology early before children uh, develop symptoms that can be severe and that will affect their quality of life. If we are successful translating this into the clinic, it will help position in the University of Colorado also as leaders and innovators in quantitative diagnostic imaging uh, with a particular focus on craniofacial development. And finally, I just don't want to forget mentioning the potential that this kind of technology could have in the healthcare market as it can significantly improve the management of patients with pathologies and syndromes affecting cranial development. So thank you for the opportunity to present here and I hope I can hear from any potential collaborators soon. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we have Tamara Terzian. Uh, good morning. My name is Tamara Terzian, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Dermatology, School of Medicine. Um, my lab uh, research focuses mainly on the role of the tumor uh, suppressor uh, P53, that is a major also transcriptional factor. Uh, in uh, development, pigmentation, and cancer. Uh, as many of you know, P53 needs to be um, uh, maintained at low levels in normal tissues, and uh, it's only when you have a stressor, cellular stressor, like um, environmental stressors like UVR or oncogenic activation, P53 is upregulated, and it will trigger important cellular um, uh, programs like apoptosis uh, and uh, senescence. Um, and it's been known that P3 not only uh, now is in cancer, but also in other uh, diseases. Um, for example, we are studying uh, lymphedema and lymphatic abnormalities. Uh, and you can see that uh, 
um, you have a buildup of fluid um, in the extremities um, that is very painful and, uh, and it's a chronic health issue. You can, we, uh, we found that also like uh, PIF3 having a role in melanoma uh, where you have a hyperproliferation of melanocytes. Uh, we also like trying to target it for vitiligo, which is a pigmentary disease. Um, and for uh, these modeling of uh, human diseases, we use heavily mouse models. Um, for example, here we have the um, lymphedema in, uh, in mice, uh, and you have a buildup of the edema uh, and uh, cutaneous hemorrhaging. We link it to the humans where you see that uh, PIF3 is upregulated in human tissues that have uh, uh, lymphatic abnormalities. We also like use mouse models of melanoma where you follow metastasis, the survival, uh, mouse models of pigmentation where, where you can see here hyper, uh, focal hyper uh, proliferation of melanocytes. Um, and we study the signaling that leads to this uh, kind of like a tanning response uh, in mice. Um, we use um, methodologies such, such as immunochemistry, uh, comparative pathology um, and uh, molecular analysis. Um, and for the moment, our teams were international and on our campus with Dr. Nakano Tamburini, uh, Box Lab and Lymphatic Club. And we are missing our uh, partners uh, that work on vascular and cellular biology um, um, to team up with on the Boulder campus. So, or uh, for drug delivery, because we also do uh, targeting of P53 in, uh, in our mouse models. So I think Dr. Goodwin, would be a very uh, good choice if he would like to team up. Um, and uh, for our application is, uh, is generally for uh, prevention of all the three diseases that we study um, and treatment. Uh, our funding uh, has been um, from NIH, but uh, recent funding is from the Cancer League or the ASA, and we are looking, and the Atomwise for the drug treatments, and we're looking forward for uh, funding from Dermatology Foundation or the NINCI. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. And that's just the kind of thing we, we hoped would happen uh, during this session is people identifying uh, each other. So always let us know if we can help with any introductions or connections as well. Thank you. And next up we have Bob McLeod. Hi, uh, I'm from electrical engineering uh, and material science at uh, CU Boulder. Um, the problem we're trying to address is the growing field of organs on chip for uh, doing drug and uh, basic organ research. Uh, these currently are all fabricated in a clean room, uh, and that turns out to work very well for the microfluidic side of these chips, the various valves, uh, chambers, and, and sort of the plumbing that you need for microfluidics. Turns out it works pretty poorly on the, uh, the organ or tissue side. And the main reason is the mechanical environments that you can fabricate uh, with uh, soft lithography and things like that in the clean room are, are just really not representative of the complex soft, uh, biofunctionalized uh, scaffolds that we know so well from fields like regenerative medicine. So there's a mismatch uh, uh, that we, we know how in, in making bio implants to print very relevant microenvironments for human cells, uh, but we don't know how to put those together currently with the uh, microfluidics to make this, this dream of organs on chip. So my group already works uh, pretty deeply in the regenerative field uh, with uh, Virginia Ferguson, who's the mechanics and biomechanics expert, and Stephanie Bryant, uh, who is the, the stem cell and regenerative medicine expert. Um, we, this is an exploratory project. Uh, we're just getting started on this work. Um, so we're looking for someone uh, who's, who's got an exciting application that might want to work with us. But what we figured out how to do is, um, print uh, through the techniques we're used to right now, which is light-based 3D printing, um, into closed volumes of microfluidic environments. And so the picture here is uh, from a recent proposal um, showing uh, just a little cartoon of the closed environment of a microfluidic cell where we would uh, squirt resins into that through the microfluidics 
do the complex 3D structuring optically. Notice that we don't have to touch the interior sterile volume. Um, we're using very small amounts of materials. Remainder would be squirted on out, uh, and then you would repeat that process multiple times with cellular or acellular tissues, or, or sorry, resins. Um, we're very good at printing uh, degrading res uh, resins, uh, soft hydrogels, functionalized hydrogels, um, usually acellular, uh, but I think in this environment, uh, we could apply a little bit what we know about printing cell-laden resins. So the, the high level goal of this um, is to allow us to print many, many replicates uh, in a way that would be fairly transparently easy to a biologist, a sort of a CAD file approach, uh, and have libraries then of human organs on chip. Uh, there's the obvious applications there are basic uh, research into organ function. Uh, I'm pretty excited long term about the ideas, uh, the idea of replacing animal testing and trying to use, uh, use these as a library of uh, human tissue types and organs, maybe long term even systems uh, to, uh, to test against uh, human cell types in appropriate environments. Um, we're good at the 3D printing. We have a lot of NIH and NSF funding right for this right now um, and uh, have gone into animal trials with a lot of the structures we make. We have not yet done the printing in these chips. Uh, we have here at CU experts in the microfluidics. So really looking for someone who might, uh, might have a good application for this um, and would be willing to sort of do exploratory work on moving towards organs on chip. Thank you. Thanks very much. Next we have Nick Jacobson. Hi there. Um, I'm a clinical design researcher and computational designer in the CU uh, Anschutz campus, uh, in, working for InWorks Innovation Initiative. And I want you to imagine needing to receive a new heart valve. Currently, there exists uh, the ability to undergo minimally invasive procedure from a catheter by a tiny incision near your groin. Recovery time is short with few complications, and on average, pa patients are back to work in about two days. However, the surgeon comes in to your room and informs you that you do not qualify for this minimally invasive procedure because there are no devices that are being made that fit your unique anatomy. And the only option is to undergo open heart surgery, which carries enormous risk and an extensive recovery time. Today, open heart surgery is the only option for 125,000 children and elders per year and growing. A personalized heart valve would allow for most, if not all of these patients to be eligible for minimally invasive surgery, improving the quality and extending the life of people all around the world. We are developing a solution uh, consisting of a 3D printed patient specific device for the pulmonary and aortic valve to address that need. We work very closely with Dr. Gareth Morgan and Dr. Jenny Zabla, the director of, uh, Dr. Morgan is the director of interventional congenital cardiology at Children's Hospital. And uh, he's been quoted as saying that one size does not fit all, one size valve does not fit all. We are currently trying to shoehorn in valves designed for uh, elderly into babies with congenital heart disease. And a personalized heart valve um, would eliminate many of our current problems and revolutionize the treatment of congenital and structural heart defects. Our process involves building a 3D model of a patient's specific anatomy based on medical images. We leverage parametric design tools to model the device. And then we integrate uh, printing, 3D printing specific structural analysis tools and finally fabricate based upon a patent pending process for voxel printing, which allows us to map every single pixel coming off of a medical image to a droplet coming out of the printer. Our team consists of Dr. Gareth Morgan, Director of Interventional Cardiology at Children's Hospital, Dr. Jenny Zabla, Interventional Cardiologist at Children's Hospital, and Dr. Robert McCurdy, the Boulder Mateer uh, Mechanical Engineering Department, who is bringing uh, 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 bringing the physics-based multi-material design and modeling expertise to our, our project. This project is estimated to take around 5.5 years or five and a half years involving full-blown animal studies and clinical trials. However, prior to our animal studies, our new technology requires further development around material science to develop biomechanical 
or biocompatible soft polymers for 3D printing. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thanks very much. Uh, next, we have Richard Hahn. Hello, uh, my name is Rick Hahn, and I'm a professor of computer science uh, at uh, CU Boulder. Um, we've been working on a, an idea called the self-wrapping active bandage. Uh, this idea came out of a robotic materials workshop uh, held at CU Boulder, uh, including Stanford, Berkeley, and others. And so the idea here is to demonstrate the feasibility of a self-wrapping active bandage. And so this thing would uh, uh, sense the dimensions of a limb that it's put on and uh, also the extent of the wounds, uh, then automatically self-wrap to uh, uh, cover the correct area and tighten to the correct degree. And so as you can imagine, uh, there are a lot of challenges here. It has to be accurate in terms of coverage. It has to be safe in terms of the amount of uh, pressure that it's providing. Uh, it has to be reliable, automated, hands-free, ideally wireless, um, fast, strong, low cost and lightweight. So a ton of challenges here. Um, and so we imagine in terms of the technical approach that uh, we're gonna need a sort of novel uh, multi-layered robotic material uh, with uh, embedded distributed actuation, sensing, computation, and wireless communication. Uh, and so this is gonna require innovations in a lot of different areas, uh, 3D self-localization of the bandage uh, as well as the wound, uh, sort of 3D distributed wrapping control algorithms, uh, we need safety algorithms so that uh, the bandage doesn't tighten too much or too little, but just the right amount. Uh, and so this will probably involve some machine learning. Um, uh, robotic material sort of sits at the intersection, sort of interdisciplinary uh, between uh, computer science and materials science. And so uh, we think uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, interesting uh, new work in, in sort of integrating these two areas as well as the different subsystems uh, involved. So we've, this is an early uh, sort of, uh, we, we've been working on this for about a year and we have a self-tightening prototype, which we show here on the lower left. And uh, uh, as sort of shown here, we've just been experimenting with, uh, you know, can we show, uh, can we understand what the challenges are uh, for the full self-wrapping vision uh, over here on the lower left. Uh, and so this is just, we call it self-tightening. Uh, we've been testing the control algorithms, uh, we have mechanical actuation that will pull multiple strands of different fabrics tighter uh, so we can provide differential pressure. We have strain sensors that, uh, from which we infer the amount of pressure. Uh, and so this has all given us uh, some clues about sort of what are the challenges that are gonna be uh, you know, uh, coming up when we go to full 3D sort of uh, uh, self-wrapping uh, and that kind of thing. And so um, you know, we've been, uh, uh, in terms of outcomes, we imagine that uh, this will be useful for first responders in sort of those early few minutes. Uh, uh, instead of spending all that time trying to wrap a bandage around someone, you can just slap this on there uh, and the self-wrapping uh, bandage goes off and does its thing and uh, that frees the first responders to uh, you know, uh, you know, collect vital signs or communicate or, or, or do other things. Uh, we also so imagine that this could have some usage in sort of deep vein thrombosis, uh, but we are, since this is in the early stages of uh, uh, experimentation, uh, we're looking for our medical uh, collaborators and as well as engineering uh, collaborators uh, to help uh, us refine the medical application scenarios, define the medical design goals for these scenarios, uh, help us perhaps test a prototype uh, uh, in some sort of uh, lab setting uh, uh, and uh, ultimately submit uh, to DARPA, NSF, or NIH. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Robert McCurdy. Hi, yeah, I'm Rob. Um, I'm an assistant professor in mechanical engineering at CU Boulder. The problem that we're trying to solve here is that our ability to gather volumetric data from patients I would argue outstrips our ability to actually visualize those data. So with MRI, CT, and volumetric acoustic scan technologies, we get this map of these dense tissue distributions, uh, and yet our ability to see that map um, is limited. So the upper image 
shows a slice of some scan data from a patient who has a, a third ventral brain tumor. And um, the typical approach is to scan through those slices um, in a computer visualization approach and then try um, on the surgical side to, uh, in the surgeon's brain, integrate that slice data into a volumetric representation. Um, there are newer techniques that allow um, holographic, other kinds of three-dimensional visualization tools. And yet um, the surgeons tell us that they, they want to have a tactile sensation of uh, what the, the actual structures that are represented by this scan data look like, feel like, how they interrelate with other structures. All of those pieces of information are important for the surgeons to kind of plan their attack um, because every patient is different. So for that reason, um, a single sort of pre-planned model would not work, they tell us. Um, instead, we need to have a tool to turn scan data from the individual patient's situation into a tactile model that the surgeons can manipulate. And so for that, we turn to 3D printing. Um, it's a relatively recent development that in 2019, I think it was June of 2019, two AMA CPT codes were created that actually allow billing for 3D printing uh, to occur. Uh, and yet the current technology in 3D printing creates static models that cannot be manipulated. In some cases, those models can be transparent so you can see through them. Uh, and so the ability to hold, rotate that model is slightly better than looking at a computer uh, representation. But what would be much better is to actually create models that had a higher fidelity mechanical representation of the actual tissues. And so what we're working on this, in this project is to develop algorithms and material mapping uh, to be, enable uh, the printing of uh, physically plausible three-dimensional representations using today's 3D printing technology. Uh, we're not proposing that we're going to create individual materials, at least in this work, individual materials that are exactly identical to the uh, tissues that are in the patient. Rather, what we're going to try to do is to create combinations of existing materials that can approximate the differences between materials in a way that's salient for the surgeons. So we're bringing together some team members from CU Boulder who are experts in biomedical um, uh, devices, uh, biomechanics and materials, uh, and folks um, from uh, Denver who um, work in uh, computational design. You heard from Nick Jacobson just a moment ago. The initial steps are to do mechanical characterization of these materials and then to push that further to design data-driven models of those materials, then invert the problem so that we can, when we know what kind of material properties we want, we know what distribution of materials we actually need to create in this volumetric voxel-based design. It's a big market and it's growing fast. And so we think that there is um, commercial relevance for this as well. Uh, and um, we're already seeing in the 3D printing space that the patient outcomes are dramatically improved when pre-surgical planning models are used. Thanks. Thank you. Next we have Courtney Wilton Mitchell. Hello, thank you. I'm Courtney Welton Mitchell and I'm a social psychologist. And for the last eight years, I've been working at CU Boulder in research with the Institute of Behavioral Science and the Natural Hazard Center. And then a few years ago, I joined the Colorado School of Public Health on the Anschutz campus. So today I'll be talking about a project that some colleagues and I have put together. Um, we are a relatively newly formed team, so this project hasn't been funded to date. Um, but I'm presenting on behalf of myself and Dr. Charlie Little, as well as uh, Total Worker Health colleagues, uh, Lee Newman, Dr. Lee Newman and his colleagues. So we're interested in looking at the influence of risk perception, leadership, credibility, and mental health on compliance with personal protective equipment among healthcare workers during COVID-19. Um, I think it's particularly important to determine what factors might influence this compliance among hospital staff because we know that they're at high risk for contracting COVID-19. And it might be surprising to some people to realize that, you know, of course the PPE is provided, the guidance is, is provided, but it appears that compliance is actually quite variable related to understanding the use of various types of masks, gloves, gowns, head coverings, and face shields. And in part, the variability might be attributed to changing guidance. 
from various levels of hospital leadership as well. So we know emerging evidence in other settings suggests that safety behaviors can be influenced by risk perception, perceived credibility of leadership, and various mental health factors. And so we plan to examine these relationships in a hospital setting among nurses working on COVID positive and COVID negative units. So our technical approach is essentially with the methodology, first we'll examine hospital-based PPE communication materials and associated training. Um, we'll also conduct some focus groups and interviews with key stakeholders, hospital leadership, members of the PPE task force, and that will inform an online survey development. And this will be an online survey time one, um, data collected from a representative sample of 500 UCH respondents, that's 250 nurses working on COVID positive units and 250 working on other units. And again, we'll measure the variables that I mentioned around risk perception, perceived credibility of hospital leadership, mental health and safety behaviors. Now something, with, something like compliance with hospital PPE guidance, um, as you can imagine, would be uh, vulnerable to misrepresentation on self-report. So we'll actually have a variety of different ways that we'll be measuring that, including a response to case-specific vignettes around PPE compliance under particular scenarios. So this uh, proposal integrates essentially the social science research expertise and my background in social psychology linked to the Institute of Behavioral Science and the Natural Hazard Center with a high risk clinical work that's happening at Anschutz, um, particularly and drawing from Total Worker Health, but particularly from my colleagues in emergency medicine. Um, again, Dr. Charlie Little, who would be co-PI on this project. Um, IBS, and then in the School of Public Health, Environmental and Occupational Health, Center for Health Worker and Environment, and Department of Biostats and Informatics. Um, we have already been in touch with, with all of these various colleagues uh, to form the team for this project. And then the proposed funders would be for an expansion of the project and for time to and beyond. NSF Rapid with DRMS, NIOSH R21, Disaster Science Responder Research Program, Russell Sage Foundation grants are similar. And essentially the, the benefit of this project is that it has a um, myriad of applications. So it will illuminate factors that influence compliance among healthcare workers, uh, compliance with PPE among healthcare workers at a time when adoption and adherence is critical to worker safety. It will assist decision makers in understanding how to mitigate risk of contracting COVID-19 among hospital staff by addressing barriers to PPE compliance. And it has the potential to influence hospital messaging campaigns, leadership approaches, and programs designed to promote mental health and well-being as a path to increasing PPE compliance. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Aubrey Schick. Hello. Um, I'm Aubrey Schick, and I'm a new uh, research affiliate at the Atlas Institute at CU Boulder. Um, since about 2013, I've been deploying socially assistive agents with uh, children and older adults with memory care needs. So the children have been primarily autism spectrum and the older adults have been uh, dementia and Alzheimer's patients. So at this point, it's actually been uh, thousands of individuals that have interacted uh, with these systems. So a socially assistive agent, um, as opposed to, you know, robots or agents that, that help us with uh, physical tasks or things like that, um, it's, it's closer to a, a coach or a therapist or a, um, a peer-like experience that motivates and engages the individuals. And um, since beginning to deploy these systems um, in my research at Carnegie Mellon in 2013, um, I've spent a lot of time in industry and I've actually just recently returned to, to academia. And I'm really, really passionate about the opportunities in uh, digital health and digital therapeutics. Many people don't know that while they're familiar with the FDA's uh, medical device track and the cl clinical trials and whatnot related to that, there's a new track within the FDA that's only existed for about three years called digital health um, that includes uh, uh, software related solutions. So where this, where this project is now is we have an, an open source software that allows for both um, in-person interventions where uh, therapies are 
uh, therapeutic interventions can be crafted by a, um, by a therapist or a child development specialist or a teacher that then can be you know, implemented with the children where um, either, either robots or um, you know, app-based agents uh, can interact with the children. What we find, the, the biggest report that, that we find from teachers and parents is increases in uh, self-esteem. We see dramatically lengthened engagement, um, increases in verbalization, this also, uh oh, went away. Uh, this also applies to uh, the memory care patients as well. So I've worked with a large nonprofit in Pittsburgh that sees about uh, 200 pre-COVID, um, about 200 children in regular weekly classes, and about 400 older adults with dementia and Alzheimer's um, in other programs. So this is a hardware agnostic system. So we're, we're, we're trying to take an asset based approach. So if you have a mobile device or you happen to have a computer or you have VR, um, you know, a, a clinician that is uh, creating content or uh, interventions is able to leverage any of those systems um, uh, to be able to, um, to Im implement these, these therapies. And so what I'm really, really looking for is uh, research clinicians, uh, folks to help with clinical design, behavioral psychologists, uh, neuroscientists. I've had amazing experiences working with uh, occupational therapists, BCBAs, um, speech and language pathologists. And again, you know, across the, the different ages. Um, and uh, we're, we currently have funding from the National Science Foundation or the Autism Science Foundation that is uh, allowing us to ad adapt and scale the existing software to serve um, more individuals. Uh, but uh, we're very, very much looking to have more clinical validation to take some of the really, really exciting um, anecdotal evidence that we've seen and really really drive that toward that digital health application and um, scaling that opportunity. Because what, what this really allows for is that a, a clinician can create an intervention that then can be either implemented at home or implemented by a, um, a less technical or, or, or a lower skilled, maybe registered behavioral uh, therapist or otherwise behavioral specialist to, to work with these individuals and also the systems, um, the data from these systems can be built upon and learned upon so that we can have uh, greater and greater levels of automation. Um, but just to be clear, and it's kind of hard to see in the, the little tiny diagrams, um, but we're not advocating to have, um, to have patients interact solely with robots or solely with technical systems. This is a, a bridge to generalized um, engagement uh, with humans, and, and that's been one of the biggest reports uh, that we've that we've gotten from folks who've been using this in the field for years. And I'm not sure is my little timer up or not. Just about. Okay, I, I just I don't see it. Um, oh, there we go. Thank you. Now next we have Peter. Good morning, everyone. So uh, the work I'm going to talk about is applying an approach to computational speech and language analytics. And the goal really is to distinguish frontal temporal dementia from primary psychiatric disorders. And uh, I'm in the Institute of Cognitive Science. I'm also collaborating with this with uh, Dr. Peter Pressman, who's in neurology at Anschutz. Um, there's been a real problem in that people who have frontal temporal dementia, uh, it's very hard to distinguish this from uh, primary psychiatric disorders, and that can include depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. And over the last 10 to 15 years, we've been working on sets of technology where we can analyze people's language, so spoken language, what they say, how they say it. And we've developed some techniques that are very sensitive to detect how uh, severe their mental illness is, the types of mental illness they have, 
just by pulling out various different features from the language. So in this project, what we're proposing to do is to apply some of these kinds of speech analytics to distinguish these two uh, types of disorders from each other and uh, use that first to be able to provide some useful tools that can help clinicians because right now the only way the clinicians can really do it is through sort of large batteries of interviews. And second, also to use this as the basis to understand some of the more theoretical and mechanistic relationships between language measures and neuropsychological and linguistic features that are happening uh, in people's brains as they're doing it. So our approach to this really is we collect recordings of people speaking. We've developed a number of different types of tasks to do that. We apply a set of analyses to assess the language that they're uh, saying. Then we provide uh, machine learning and do classification on this. So our approach for this really is the first stage of this, we're going to use some existing pilot data that has been collected. We're going to analyze these and then try to uh, build a system that can really distinguish the PPD from the FTD uh, people there and look at how that relates uh, to it. The longer term goal of this work is to be able to do this longitudinally where we can track people over time and look for small changes uh, in their language that are indicators or biomarkers of changes in their mental states uh, over a period of time. The team that we have for this is myself at the Institute of Cognitive Science in Boulder, uh, Dr. Pressman in neurology uh, and in computer science, uh, Jim Martin and one of my uh, graduate students, Chelsea Chandler. We're looking for additional expertise, particularly people in psychiatry as well as uh, people in computational bioscience. Um, and this is a new project, or at least this group we're pulling together is a new group. Uh, we've been funded in the past from uh, NIH and uh, from the government of Norway for doing a lot of this work. But where we see this going is new kinds of tools that can use speech-based technologies, uh, particularly in this case to be able to uh, distinguish PPD from neurocognitive disorders, which is a big bottleneck uh, in the clinical field. But we also see this as really improving our understanding of a lot of the underlying uh, features uh, in speech and how those relate to the brain's neurocognitive and linguistic mechanisms. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Next, we have Jacob Holtzman. Awesome. Hi, I'm Jacob Holtzman. Uh, I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Colorado Anschutz School of Medicine. I'm in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, I'm developing this proposal along with my co-investigator, Dr. Sue Ree, whose primary appointments are in the Institute for Behavioral Genetics and the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at UC Boulder. Uh, we found our collaboration because our interests align in understanding mechanisms that are underlying development and maintenance of youth mental health concerns, particularly for those at risk for later conduct, aggression, or delinquency issues. We're both interested in examining whether or not those underlying mechanisms might translate and inform our development and adaptation of interventions that address youth mental health concerns. Uh, what we know from a lot of basic and longitudinal research is that there's a common set of risk factors for those later conduct concerns. And that's particularly how children regulate themselves, parents regulate themselves, and how they also do that together during interactions. And so that has informed a lot of our interventions. So our, our clinic at Anschutz, where I provide a lot of services and do research evaluating factors that are involved in the efficacy of those interventions, we're working on examining how we might be working to change parenting practices and use parenting-focused interventions during early childhood to act as preventative interventions and ways that we might ultimately make them more efficacious at reducing risk for later conduct concerns. Our work in these parenting focused interventions um, they were, is originally developed just to focus on changing parenting practices. So specifically we work to reduce harsh parenting, so things like uh, reducing yelling at children, doing less criticism of children, or doing less things that might be falling into categories of cor corporal punishment like spanking or slapping children. Um, alternatively, we also work to increase how parents might spend more positive time with their children, find ways to praise children, 
and ultimately use those, the shifts in parenting to change how we might regulate ourselves during interactions. Um, one of the biggest challenges in these interventions though, is that not all children and parents actually respond. And so we don't see as much change with them as we might hope to see. And which is where we think that work done by Dr. Rhee and her team is very important. Uh, their work uh, primarily examines genetic, neurobiological, and environmental mechanisms that underlie how we develop our ability to regulate ourselves, um, specifically developing self-regulation for our thoughts, our actions, and also our emotions. And so the Boulder team has a lot of expertise in how we can actually measure self-regulation. Um, they use a lot of neuroimaging, objective neuropsychological testing, and even report base of executive functioning. And so we won't... We want to capitalize on their expertise in that measurement and start to integrate that in our technical um, approach by using that within our interventions to see whether or not it predicts responses. Um, one of the things that really connects is that they've spread a line of research showing how parents' ability to regulate themselves is linked to parenting behaviors, which is what, are, what is thought of as our mechanism for these interventions. And so <clears throat> what we look back to is that they don't actually have a design in mind for parent self-regulation in the beginning. And so we have this question of whether or not that might predict responses at the end. So we plan to utilize their combined expertise in providing the interventions and in, in evaluating the efficacy, as well as how we measure self-regulation. Um, this is a brand new project, and we're hoping for developing pilot study here to look for future funding at the NIMH level for K awards or an R21 mechanism. Ultimately, we hope that this can increase collaboration between our departments and, and the interdisciplinary collaboration across different types of ways of measuring self-regulation, and then ultimately try to change our interventions to adapt them to be more helpful for parents and youth uh, struggling with me mental health concerns. Thank you. Next, we have Colleen Reed. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Colleen Reed. I'm an assistant professor in the geography department at CU Boulder. I do health geography and I also have training in public health. Um, so I'm on the Boulder campus, but much more um, of my work is possibly thought of what you'd find at the School of Public Health on the Anschutz campus. And I have two main lines of research. I'm going to focus on one of them today, which is looking at wildfires and partially because that, I think that's on everyone's minds with the air quality we've been experiencing for the past couple of weeks here in Colorado, as well as the intense wildfires in California. And so I don't, I think, you know, my, my intent on being here was to find collaborators. Um, sort of, I have a lot of different ways I want to go forward with my wildfire research and was hoping to find collaborators interested in that from the environmental side. Um, might not work, seems much more biomedical um, here, but um, my work has been to look at the health impacts of wildfires, and I think there's a few different ways that I could go in the next steps. There's a lot of open questions that need to be addressed that I'm asked a lot by the public. So, for example, um, what interventions um, from the public health side could decrease the health burden as we face these extreme air pollution events? Um, understanding why people do or do not adopt certain public health interventions. Um, there's also an interest in what the long-term health impacts are. Most of our understanding to date um, is about short-term acute impacts of the air pollution, as well as combined exposures. For example, right now we have extreme heat and air pollution, as well as the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, so, what I tend to do and um, in the past is I, I have a lot of expertise in estimating air pollution exposures using machine learning and um, geostatistical methods. Um, and then I link that with health data to try and find um, associations. I think depending on what question um, a group of us were to go forward on would determine what my collaborator, collaborators need to be. I have, um, worked with people from uh, the Forest Service, NASA. I currently am trying to collaborate more with researchers at National Jewish and Colorado State, but would like to have more researchers within the University of Colorado. And I've also been working with researchers at NCAR. So potentially there could be a need for people on the engineering side in terms of indoor air pollution, um, efforts to try and decrease indoor air pollution and its impacts on health. 
I always need statisticians to work with um, to think of new methodologies to get more causal inference. Um, I've worked previously with MDs, so pulmonologists or other other people who can, in, who can really get at some of the biomedical aspects of things. If we were to look at, you know, why are people adopting certain techniques but not others? We could look at, I, I think sociologists or psychologists could be helpful in that. In terms of funding, I've had trouble with this. I've been funded by the EPA before. Um, they aren't funding as much external research, but they're really at this intersection of health and environment, which I've been for other places. So I've been funded by the Joint Fire Science Program, NIH, and NASA, and I've recently submitted to the Health Effects Institute. So I'm open to talking more about that. And really, we're not going to get rid of wildfires um, in the Western US. Um, but we still have these health burdens associated with it. So I want to shift my research more towards understanding how we can decrease the health burden, despite the fact that we are going to continue to see these smoke events. Um, and I think that's all I've got for today. Thanks very much. Next we have Diego Restrepo. Diego, are you, can you unmute? Yeah, I wanted to say hello. I'm Diego Restrepo from Cell Developmental Biology Institute Anschutz. Uh, and in the last 10 years, there's been a revolution in understanding the brain by recording neural activity, recording calcium changes. But this is a major limitation because what you really need to record from neurons is the voltage. So, um, and what we want to do here is to make a faster imaging uh, uh, voltage sensor for freely move, moving animals. <clears throat> and this is a group that has worked in the past. We have a <clears throat> CU um, uh, Anschutz uh, a, a, a bioengineer, Dr. Emily Gibson, um, Avi Persson, who is a, a professor in uh, physiology. Uh, in CU Boulder, we have Dr. Victor Bright, uh, who is in mechanical engineering, and uh, Dr. Julie Gopinath in electrical engineering. And what we do is basically make little miniature fiber couple microscopes. So this was published about two years ago under the NIH Brain Initiative. And uh, what we'd like to do is to modify that microscope to uh, do really fast measurements of voltage at one kilohertz. And um, the technical approach is basically to do um, high-speed imaging using a sensor that's called ASAP, ASAP3. And what we really need is to incorporate a computational imaging uh, scientist from Boulder. Um, uh, the milestones would be to record at about three kilohertz, signal to noise ratio of bigger than 10 hertz, uh, 10, 10 volt, and it's to understand the brain function. Uh, so that's basically it, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have David Root. Thanks, Kristen. And uh, thanks uh, to all the organizers. Uh, my name is David Root. I'm a fairly new assistant professor in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience in Boulder. And we're interested in identifying different cell types in the brain's reward center that control different aspects of motivated behavior. So that is your everyday experiences of reward and aversion, but also in extreme states such as addiction, stress, uh, and depression. We focused on uh, the reward center ventral tegmental area, and we've discovered that there are uh, more cell types than we previously uh, thought there were. And we've developed methods in the mouse to target these different neurons, we found that they have different uh, projections throughout the brain. They seem to be sensitive to different cues and experiences uh, involved in reward and aversion. But what we're looking for now is a collaboration, um, trying to understand uh, more about these different cell types. Uh, specifically, we're looking for electrophysiologists that could perform whole cell recordings of these cells, or even um, those that can perform RNA-seq experiments trying to figure out what kind of receptors each of these cells have, what transcription factors they express 
um, et cetera. Uh, we've been lucky to uh, receive a number of awards uh, looking at uh, these different cell types in the VTA uh, for different aspects of motivated behavior. And um, all of the research that I'm proposing in the collaboration can lead to new, uh, likely NIH funded applications. So please get in touch if you're interested. Thank you, David. Daniel Denman is our next presenter. Thanks, Kristen. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Denman. I'm in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics at Anschutz. I'm a uh, new assistant professor there. I've been uh, here on campus for less than a year. Um, our uh, general, uh, I run a basic neuroscience lab here. Our general question is, is how neural, neural populations uh, underlie all forms of behavior uh, and especially uh, perception. So the way this is typically studied is one neuron or one area at a time, but it's uh, well known that the, the certain number of neurons that are involved in generating even a very simple behavior in a mammalian nervous system is on the order of millions and more likely tens, tens of millions. And so we take an approach that attempts to uh, embrace this complexity and record uh, sort of from as many neurons as we can while animals are performing a uh, visual behavioral task. And so we uh, use a couple of devices that I developed in my previous work. One is an immersive um, virtual reality system that allows us to record uh, invasively in mouse brains while an animal is performing a task that's shown there on the left of the schematic, sort of animals in a virtual reality dome. The other is a, an electrophysiology device, uh, which is uh, essentially a small array of electrodes in which we can put many small arrays of electrodes in the brain. And so see a schematic of uh, about 12 of those electrodes stuck in a rodent brain, uh, each one of them can record several hundred neurons. So we're talking uh, order uh, several thousand uh, neurons at once. And our, our goal here in looking for collaborator, collaborators is uh, one, uh, always interested in, in developing new devices. As I said, I helped develop those um, electrophysiology devices in my previous work. And so I'm um, looking at new ways to record from large scale uh, ensembles of neurons throughout the brain is, is a big part of our research, but especially um, dealing with the sort of scale of uh, analytics and quantitative modeling of this type of data is, is our goal in, in seeking out collaborators. So um, looking at um, computational models, uh, applied, applied mathematicians and, and physicists who are interested in working with this, with this data. Um, currently funded by the NIHI Institute, uh, National Eye Institute, um, with, uh, with good applications for uh, many types of, of brain initiative funding through this kind of work. We're a basic neuroscience lab interested in, in many types of questions um, that, that underlie basically all forms of, uh, of neural function. So um, if you're interested in these technologies or in um, working with the scale of data, yeah, please, uh, please get in contact. Thanks. Thank you. Next, Michael Schertz. All right, so I'm selling things a little bit differently here in that um, we've got a range of tools in my group uh, that we use to look uh, computationally at um, atomistic details of molecular association. Uh, we've worked with a number of problems such as looking at protein interactions with polymer brushes uh, with uh, Dan Schwartz and Joel Carr. Uh, protein peptide interactions uh, in chemical engineering, protein peptide interactions with Deborah Wutke. And um, so what we're really looking for is collaborators who you know, have some interesting problem where the molecular details are important um, and, and use molecular help showcase our methods uh, uh, in, in the process of that. So uh, we use atomistic molecular modeling to model configurational ensembles to really get the configurational ensemble of a, of a biophysical uh, problem at the molecular level. Um, I think our expertise, you can share some papers, we're really at the forefront of developing a lot of these approaches for calculating the inviting free energies. Um, so we don't have a single project we're working right now. We've worked with um, uh, Samaki in chemistry, uh, Watke Biochem, uh, also working on non-biological applications of these approaches uh, it, with, with Doug Jin and Rich Noble in chemistry. Um, so really what we're looking for is collaborators with compelling problems that molecular insight is, is, is required for. 
Um, we have some NIH funding for some of these, but really we'd be really what we're looking for, um, any system where there's compelling physical questions inaccessible to experiment that involve molecular conformational ensembles uh, with the impact really that we want to help collaborators find compelling hypotheses from inspection of these molecular details and um, you know, rationalize experimental successes, failures. A lot of these are not quite high throughput enough to really do sort of molecular design, though they're getting there. Uh, the, the more useful part right now is rationalizing uh, successes and failures. And, you know, a lot of times people are interested in having some modeling. So it reviewers, you know, if, if it's, if it helps you just to get the proposal through and it's an interesting question, we can help answer. That's uh, the sort of thing that we're interested in doing. So, um, yeah, that's what we're looking for is collaborators who have those problems and then we can collaborate to help solve them and showcase what we can do at the same time. That's it. Thank you. Next, we have Ed Lau as our presenter. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, my name is Edward Lau, and I'm a new assistant professor in CU Anschutz Cardiology. And um, my lab is interested in how different cell types communicate with each other through extracellular signals that they release, uh, primarily in relation to their heart, uh, where there are three major cell types, the cardiomyocytes, endothelial cells, and the fibroblasts that make up the majority of cells in the organ. Um, in the cardiac field, there's been a lot of interest in paracrine signaling because of its role in regenerative therapy and also cardiac development. But up till now, really, there hasn't been a lot of work done to, to understand the exact molecular components that are released by each cell type at different time or under different physiological states. And this is in part due to technical challenges. For example, traditionally, it would be very hard to tease out which cell type did a particular molecule in the plasma really come from. Um, and our approach is, is to use uh, human induced blueprint and stem cells or iPSCs, uh, perform in vitro differentiation protocols to make these cell types individually in, in different dishes so that their respective contribution to secreted molecules can be dissected separately in, in the lab. And with these cells, we have applied an optimized number of workflows to collect and, and process the culture media and isolate extracellular vesicles in order to discover the, the molecules that are contained in these vesicles. And in some ongoing applications, we have found that, uh, for example, microRNAs that are specifically released by iPSCs, but not cardiomyocytes and vice versa. And we show that we can use the, for example, the ratios of, of an IPSC specific microRNA, uh, like MIR302, and a non specific microRNA that ubiquitously released, like MIR16, to derive a, a quantitative measure of, of the proportion of IPS cells in a co culture down to maybe 0.1% or less of IPSC. Um, so this could, for example, be useful to identify potential cell contamination in a cardiomyocyte production system uh, for regenerative medicine purposes. And in terms of, of teams and collaboration, uh, currently we have experience in IPSC models and doing total RNA sequencing and proteomics from the medium and analyzing the data with some bioinformatics. Uh, and really we are looking for new collaborations in different areas. Um, uh, for example, uh, if, if someone is interested in computational modeling and the data to predict uh, the trajectory of cellular differentiation or an engineer to, to improve either cell culture or how to harvest the vesicles. And we're currently supported by the department and division and also have an, uh, an NHL BI R00 that funds a related project that supports personnel. So we're looking to submit a, a seed grant application here to support reagents to, to develop the project further. And hopefully uh, can also do a joint external application in the future through NHL BI or NIGMS uh, using preliminary data from the seed grant. So uh, for, for outcomes going forward, we want to, to apply this framework to different areas. For example, you know, uh, one question we're asking is, can we use extracellular microRNAs and nanomolecules as an early readout to predict you know, progression and quality of, of, of cell production? And also want to look for extracellular signals that correspond to disease status and use that to monitor cellular health and drug response over a longitudinal period of time. Uh, I look forward to you know getting in touch and potentially forming a new collaboration on campus and, and, and with Boulder. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We're moving right along. Uh, Frank Barnes is our next to last presenter. Okay. Uh, we've been looking at the use of weak 
electric and magnetic fields as a way of changing chemical reaction rates. And the most directly applicable um, <clears throat> result we have, <clears throat> excuse me, is changing the growth rate of cancer cells. We can in inhibit the growth of uh, fibrosarcoma cells by more than 40% by applying signals uh, that are <clears throat> 200 microtesla, which is about four times the Earth's magnetic field. <clears throat> and we can change the numbers a bit, change the frequency, and we can accelerate the growth of these cells. We've also shown we can change the growth rate of bacteria and, bac and viruses. And so what I think we have is potentially a new tool for modifying chemical reaction rates <clears throat> in biological systems and particularly changing reactive oxygen and species of various kinds. And so we're clearly interested in people in, in two directions. One, both uh, in getting at some of the chemistry and modifying processes, biological processes, particularly involving reactive oxygen, other signaling molecules like calcium and uh, OH minus and nitric oxide, et cetera. And secondly, applications where having a non-invasive sensor might be of most interest. And Joseph Mill in uh, chemistry and Mark Hernandez have been working with me on in the Boulder campus uh, and uh, Mark in civil environmental engineering, particularly with the bacteria. So we have a, we think a potential tool for both accelerating and inhibiting it. And what's different than been had in many times in the past, we have a theoretical basis for which these might work in changing reactive, uh, the Zeeman shift and some physics under it, and also the effects of feedback with a time delay. So we're looking for both applications and for uh, getting at the fundamentals of understanding the processes by which we might be able to use electric and magnetic fields. A side issue is potential health effects of exposure to wireless, particularly with 5G coming out. And a lot of stuff that's talked about this is either says it's completely safe or it's absolutely deadly. And there's a lot to be understood in that area that's not there. We've been currently funded by DARPA we have the potential sources of funds in NSF, NIH, and possibly elsewhere. We'd be very much interested in collaborating with people who might go so take us from, say, cells to mice to humans, for example. I think it would be interesting and possible that we might be able to inhibit the growth of breast cancer non-invasively by over 50% if we optimize some parameters. So those are things to be explored. And I think there's a lot of interesting and fun possibilities here. I'm very much interested in hearing from anybody who might be interested in exploring this farther. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, we have Jim Sisper. Sipser. Very good, thank you. I'm uh, the CEO of Cirque Cryotech, and I'm standing in for Tom Johnson who is a tenured faculty at the Institute for Behavioral Genetics on the Boulder campus. And the problem that we were interested in is that agents that are used to uh, preserve things in the cold, cryoprotective agents, are actually toxic. So things that are stored in the cold can be brought back to the functional temperature. And lo and behold, some of them are not there because of the toxicity of the cryoprotective agents. The way we decided to approach this problem was to use a platform, that is to say a high throughput platform composed of mouse embryonic stem cells. And we were able to use that to screen, that is to say to select for mutants that were resistant to cryoprotective agents. For example, M22, a vitrifying agent that's uh, hopefully gonna be used someday to uh, cryopreserve entire organs. In the meantime, we're interested in the less ambitious goals of increasing the, the uh, return on uh, cryopreserved cells and tissues. We've found six mutants, and one of those mutants 
seems to correspond to a biochemical pathway which has a drug application and we're interested in a drug of interest. But uh, we, I wanna stress that our platform can actually be used to screen against a wide variety of toxicities. In fact, we already have published results indicating that uh, screening for resistance to reactive oxygen species, such as hydrogen peroxide or paraquat, has resulted in finding mutants that could be generated into whole mice, which in turn have cells that are resistant to reactive oxygen species. The reason I mention this is because although we're interested in cryopreservation applications at the moment, we'd be interested in collaborating with people who are dealing with other toxicities such as ischemia reperfusion in models such as surgery, uh, limb reattachment or reconstructive surgery. Because of that, we're looking at funding from the DOD. Uh, we will participate as CERC, the company, in the Lab Venture Challenge and we may resubmit a grant from the, to, to the uh, National Institute for uh, Kidney and Digestive, to, excuse me, Digestive Diseases. Uh, we're also interested in the cryopreservation of stem cells and cord blood and the challenges that are met there. So if you're interested in this technology, please get in touch with us. Thank you. And thanks to all of our presenters. This was a really um, very wide, varying group of people and excited to hear more about all of your work. Hopefully there are things that you've seen today that uh, you could connect with, but also if you feel that one of your colleagues uh, might be interested in one of the presentations today, uh, feel free to get in touch with the presenter, get in touch with Diane, Liddell, or myself. Uh, we can help make connections and um, hopefully connect people who are looking for collaborations. Thank you again. I uh, just wanted to make mention of how you can all get involved in the AB Nexus. Uh, as many of you know, we have the grant program that is coming up. The first cycle is this fall, uh, September 14th. We'll have a notice of intent due, uh, and that's just a short form to let us know you're planning to apply, describe who the team is, um, and a brief abstract of what your research project will entail. The full application, which is about four pages, is going to be due on October 16th. And then for those of you who won't be able to apply this cycle, we are going to repeat the grant cycle in the spring. So um, if things don't come together for this fall deadline, um, you can look forward to putting something together for the spring. Uh, we'd also ask anyone who is not applying for the grant program to consider signing up to be a reviewer. Uh, junior faculty are especially encouraged if you're looking to gain experience um, in reviewing, anything like that. And then here's a link to sign up to receive our news and events. So as we hold things like info sessions uh, or this research blitz event, um, you can be made sure to be made aware of them. Other than that, just thank you all for attending, for presenting, uh, and Diane and I will look forward to hearing from you, helping however we can. We will be posting the recording to our website uh, of all of the presenters who are okay sharing the, their information publicly, uh, but let us know if we can help make any connections. We'd be happy to do so. Thank you kindly, everyone.